So about post-processing, uh, suppose you have an image. So you have this image that comes from your demo, from your video game, from a 3D engine. Or maybe it's an image that you got from a camera or maybe from Photoshop. So you have that image that comes from one of those means. And you want to pretend that it comes from another mean, that you got it from a different device. You want to pretend that your picture doesn't come from your demo, but you want to pretend that instead it comes from some camera, from a 35 fil millimeter film camera. Or maybe you want to pretend it comes from, a, say, a magnetic tape archive of some security footage. So if that was the case, the image would look different, obviously, because all cameras have different characteristics, which means they have like they are going to generate different images and sort of making the taste of the image. And that is going to, so all cameras are different, and in particular, they are very different from the pinhole camera model, which your 3D engine is most likely based upon. And so it looks different, and even though you want your image to look like that. So one thing you can do is take your, the picture you got out of your demo, and make some modifications to it, to add information, to remove information, to filter it. So it looks like it comes from this other camera. And this is the kind of post-processing we're going to talk about today. Before we can get started, there are a couple of things that you need uh, before you can start happily changing your image. Um, you need your pipeline to be gamma correct. You need to have enough precision and it's not strictly necessary, but most likely you need high dynamic range. So first and foremost, you need a gamma correct engine. Uh, quick question. In this room, who doesn't know what I'm talking about when I say that you need your pipeline to be gamma correct? Please raise your hand. OK, keep your hands up. Who knows what gamma correct means, but is not quite sure what it means to what you would have to change to in your engine, how you would have to change the way you work, so it uh, so it's still gamma correct. Okay, keep your hands up. I'm going to to, to stand. Okay, and of the remaining people, who is not working with the gamma correct engine? If you don't know, also, also raise your hand. OK, so the people with the, with the hands up in the air, please locate the, the people, the, the closest person next to you with the, with the hand down. <laughs> Remember their face, establish contact, exchange your email, your phone number, and after you're out of this room, you guys need to talk. Uh, OK, so the gamma correct thing. Uh, I'm starting with the, with the picture. Uh, I took like a picture that pretty much everyone has seen at some point in his life. So the idea of, um, of gamma correct is if you're going to display two colors on your screen and one of them has a value twice as big as the, as the other color, as the value of the other color, you'd expect it to be twice as bright as the other color. And the reality is different uh, because your screen is not behaving in a, in a linear way. Uh, that has to, to do with the historical reason, I believe, because back then we had electron beam screens, and to increase the brightness, you would increase the voltage, and that is not a linear function. So you put twice as much value, and you don't get twice as much brightness. Um, we could have changed that, but it sort of stayed that way. And now that we don't have electron beams anymore, we still have screens that uh, emulate that behavior. And the reason why is because it's something that you actually want. Because your eye is not behaving in a linear way either. Uh, you're much better at discriminating dark shades of gray than you are at discriminating bright shades of white. So if you're going to have a limited number of colors that you can display on a screen, you better have more of them in the shades that your eye is good at discriminating. And it's a pure coincidence, but it just so happened that the, the response of a screen is a fairly good match to the response of the eye. So it's by pure chance. Like uh, one of them is a biological fact, and the other one is, has to do with voltage. But imagine yourself being shipping monitors. It works, so yeah, ship it. But now, 
we have a problem, which is that the colors that you display on the screen are not correct. And someone has to fix it, and that is you. So here is a small ray tracer I did on Shadow Toy. Uh, on the left, you have the gamma correct. And on the right, you have the what you get out of the box if you don't do gamma correction. And if you remember the picture we've just seen before, you can notice that the shadow is very sharp. Like the, the transition between light and shadow is very, it, it's very quick. But if you don't have gamma correction, it's going to be like much smoother. Uh, you might think, oh, OK, it's not such a, a big deal. Uh, another problem you're going to have is if you don't have a linear transition. So here we have a couple of gradients. On the left, you have gamma correct. On the right, you have non-gamma correct. So you can see that in the middle, it's, it looks much darker when it's not gamma correct. But when it's gamma correct, it looks pretty much the same brightness all the way. And you can notice also that the colors, like not, uh, not only the, um, the brightness is different, the color is different. Like on the top, for example, on the top left, it looks much more pink on the left than the, than the non-gamma correct version. So the punchline is, if, you don't, if you're not gamma correct, you're going to have bad shadows, you're going to have bad hues. So you, you need to apply a f uh, the inverse function of your screen before you, before you display your image. So you have your image, you, you apply the inverse function. It's going to cancel out when it displays on screen, and then you're happy. Uh, another problem you're going to have, though, is since screens are not gamma correct, the pretty much all image capture maker, image capture device makers have been taking this thing into account, which means virtually every single camera is, gener is uh, storing an, an image that is trying to cancel this, uh, this gamma problem. So what you, you never see it, but what your camera stores is a brighter image. And that means if you have assets that you load in your, in your demo engine, you will, have to, to, you will have to change them before you can use it. So you have your texture that you load. It's been like it's artificially brighter than it should, should be. So you have to change it. Then you can use it in your shading, which is supposed to happen in linear space. And when your uh, picture is ready, you apply an inverse gamma function. It cancels out with the screen. And then you have a, a picture that you're happy with. It's not very difficult. Uh, depending on your engine, it can take uh, between one day and one weekend. Uh, if you have something much more complex, well, then you're out of luck. But really, that's something you should do. And when like, there are two days left uh, in here, so you guys really should do that when you're back at, at your seat. Uh, again, you should talk. Like the, the people who, who already have that, that in, the, in their engine, please show the other people how easy to, or what, what it means, what you have to change the code. And that should be the first thing you change when you go home. Second thing you need is precision. If we're going to change the image, we're going to filter it uh, all the way. We, every time we change the image, we're going to lose some information. So you better have enough information when you start with, so you, so you get something good in the end. Uh, this is an exaggerated example. Uh, those are gradients in uh, RGB 565. So obviously, it's, it's not as good as 32-bit uh, as, uh, RGB, but it's already showing. This is only making the, uh, the gradient gamma correct. And you already see that in the blacks, you pretty much have no information left anymore. Uh, the industry standard seems to be to use 16-bits per channel. Uh, if 32-bits is probably of a kill. If you don't have enough uh, to spare, you can use all the formats. Uh, at uh, Control Alt Test, we've been using RGB 11, 11, 10. It's uh, between four and eight times more information as uh, RGB 888. So for us, it's enough. Uh, maybe it won't be enough for you, but I mean, you can try and see like what works for you. And uh, the last uh, thing you might need is uh, high dy dynamic range. Uh, so high dy dynamic range, the idea is instead of having the information that is somewhere between 0 and 1 and you display it on screen, you just say it's between 0 and potentially much, like lots, gazillions. And so the, the in 
Like the, the reason you might want that is, for example, if you have one very bright spot on your screen, but it takes only one pixel, and during your post-processing, you're going to blur it. If, you, if you're if you clumping to one, when you blur it, you're going to get some dim gray. It's uninteresting. But if you have a value that is above one, then you can blur it, and you still get something bright. So the first effect uh, would be the, the bloom, or the, the glow effect. So the idea, the idea behind this effect is when you're taking a picture with your camera or your, like either a video camera or you're making a photo, the, your lens is not perfect. And no matter how expensive it is, it's going to have a couple of defects. And the, this means it's, it's never going to be 100% crisp. So when you have a spot of light, you're going to have a spot of light on your film, but you're going to have, a couple, you're going to have some part of the light that is, that is going to scatter all over the place. Um, so the better the lens, the smaller the, the amount of this light, the, the amount of uh, scattered light. But if you have a bright incoming light, it's going to scatter all over the place, and it's going to be noticeable. Uh, this effect is still small. Uh, I had to go to, to an extreme example to get something that is visible. Uh, I went through a couple of pictures, and usually it's only a small fringe, so don't overdo this effect. Anyway. So the idea to make this effect is we just take the incoming picture, and we are going to blur it all the way and add it back to the original image. Uh, so maybe I can show you an example for this. So this is live. OK, so this is our demo we released a year ago. Allez là. So here we have this thing over here that is very bright. Yes, this guy. Oops. Sorry about that. This is not my computer, so I'm a little bit confused. So this is the original picture. Oh, uh, wait a second. So this is just as live as it can get. And we're going to remove this effect over here, because I don't want it. OK, so this is the picture we get out of the renderer. This is what we're going to work on. The idea is going to be we take that picture, we blur it, and we're going to add it back on the original thing. Um, the premise, we want the, the glow to be, uh, to be wide. And we don't, so do people know how to make a, a glow effect? C can you raise your hand if you know already how to do this? OK, we have, OK. So the idea is we take one pixel. We, we want to know the color of one pixel. And for that, we're going to take the, the color of the pixel around it. We're going to make what, what is called a kernel. And so we take the color of, say, the, the left pixel, and the right pixel, and the top pixel, and the bottom pixel, and maybe the 10 pixels on the left and the 10 pixels on the right, et cetera, et cetera. It, and if you do that, so you have a huge square of pixels that you want to know the, the, the color. But doing so is quite expensive. You don't want to, like if you want something that is going to be 50 pixels wide, you're going to have 50 by 50 pixels to, to read. And that's, that's a lot of information. And you have to do, to do that all over, the, all over your screen. Uh, so there is a first trick you can use. If your kernel is said to be separable, so it means you don't have to, to do all at once. You can do a, a vertical pass and an horizontal pass and it gives mathematically the, the same result, then you're happy because instead of having 50 by 50, you have 50 plus 50 thing that you read. Uh, if you have a Gaussian blur, you can do that. So we have a share. Um, so that's what we do. And well, OK. Sorry. Wow. 
parti. Uh, so let's see. Um, well, I'm a little bit confused with this computer. So I want the texture number number two. So here is an example. Oh wait, I, I already had this. It's number three. This is a modified version of our shader just to show you the, the different steps. And OK, so this is what we get after we do a lot of blur on top of the image. Um, so maybe I can remove this over here. No, it doesn't change anything. OK. So we have this, uh, this blood version that we're going to add on top of our original color. And once we add them, nope. OK, so this is uh, the original uh, color, but with tone mapping, because it's easier to understand this way. Uh, this is like. I take the, the picture, I, I apply tone mapping because I want it to, to look a certain way. Um, so this is normally the last step, but I'm just showing it now because it's easier to, to understand what the effects are going to do. Uh, so if I'm not, je vais pas y arriver, hein? All oh, right, OK. I wanted to show you this effect first, but it's not the first effect applied. So you have another effect kicking in. Sorry about that. Ah. OK, so it's not very clear, unfortunately. Um, maybe I can just disactivate the, deactivate the other effects. Yeah, it's not very visible, unfortunately. Uh, give me a second. OK, so we want this. Let's see how this turns out. And it's not visible at all, man. OK, the, the premise, the, we're using a very faint value for the glow, so I can't really show it to you right now, unfortunately. Um, what if I just change this value? Yeah, it's not very faint. Well, I'm sorry about that. I, I cannot show you this effect in particular. It seems I have a version that is not using it. So you'll have to trust me that when you add your image and the blurred version, you, you get a glow. Um, anyway, moving on. So the next effect is the, the idea of having dirt on the, on the lens. Uh, so you've all seen the, uh, the Unity or the, uh, especially the uh, Unreal Engine effect, where you have like this awesome action thing, and it looks like someone splashed a bucket full of mud on top of the camera. Uh, I tried to find a reference image, so I found this, but I don't think it's actual dirt on the lens. I think it's more dirt on the windshield. And doing photography myself, I sort of doubt this effect really exists. Like, uh, I've never seen it on my camera. When I have dirt on my lens, it's not visible because it's so, sh it's so close to the lens that you don't see it. 
But anyway, if you want this effect, there is a very simple way to do. The, the picture we just computed, uh, we just created with a, with a glow, we can use it for various things. And what we are doing uh, in our engine is we use this picture as a, as a reference, like so, I mean the, the blurred one. So I'm going to show it again. Je ne comprends pas comment on change de... Merci. Nope. Yeah. So what we do is, on top of the original picture, we're going to add some geometry, so some rounds like the, like the ones uh, on the on the photo, and we use this blurred image to to say what color these uh, these plates are going to be. So when we use when we use it, we get something like. this. Okay, so I hope it's visible enough. And c'est désactivé, j'ai l'impression. It's not visible, is it? It's not visible. Why is it? Oh, because I sorry, because I removed it in the other file. So here it is. So this has to do with, OK. So here you can see one, like the guy over here. So this is just a quad that is displayed on top of the picture uh, with a texture that obviously look, looks like a, like a round thing. And the, the color we use for this quad is the color we had in the blurred version of the picture. and we so we have like a maybe 100 or 200 quads that are always displayed. And we just use the color of the blurred picture uh, multiplied by 0 0.000 something. And it's only, it only gets visible when you have enough light for it. So if I use the camera, yeah. So you can see how it, it makes the different quads visible. Yeah, and this is the end of the world. So yeah, and if I get closer, I'm going to have much more light visible over here. So yeah, that's the idea. Let's get back. Um, OK, moving to maybe more interesting effect, uh, the lens flare. So the lens flare is, you know, those things. Um, so. In, in uh, many games, what they do is they know their, the, where their source light is, and from there they can they know the position, so they can just uh, ask an artist to make something that looks like that, and they're going to align it uh, because they know where the, the source of light is. So usually it's it's fairly aligned with uh, with the center of the screen. So you have the source of light over here. Well, it's quite difficult to move the <laughs> the mouse on the table. Uh, and you have like this line that crosses the center of the screen, and you display different things that represent the different uh, reflections with the with the lens. So you can see, for example, you have a very faint over here. Uh, you have like those hexagon over here. You have another one here. You have a big one over here, and you have like this sort of caustic thing, and you have like this big rainbow ri uh, fringe over there. Uh, so this kind of shape here is quite difficult to do. That's interesting. My mouth is not moving at the same speed on this screen and on this one. OK. Um, so again, for this, we're using the, uh, the blurred image that we had before. And the idea is, OK, we have this blurred image, uh, this blurred version of the picture. We're going to, to add it on top of our picture using different scales between uh, minus something to plus something. And it's going to do this, uh, this effect. So uh, I can show it to you. 
over here. So let's get to the next step. Raté. Okay, so here it is. It's very faint, it's difficult to see. Uh, give me a second, I'm going to remove everything. Okay, so one thing is... Oh. Interesting. Okay. So, <laughs> zero. Damn it. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Is it? Oh, it's barely visible, isn't it? Okay. Um, I'm going to in artificially increase this. Okay, so this is a much exaggerated version. So yeah, you have this source of light over here and we just Add a lot of a lot of those. So the interest, as compared to a, say a geometric approach, where you know where your light is and you're going to apply things, is well. For one thing, I don't need to know where the light is, and I can have things that uh, I can shade things uh, that that I don't even know the position. Like for example, a reflection, something like that. Um, so for example, if I so I'm not sure it's going to work, but wow, the time sign is a little bit extreme. So let's take a different example. Um, yeah, so for, you know, for example, those, there is no way I'm going to put a spot of light on every single one of them. Uh, but here it's going to work. I'm going to add back the zero over here. So yeah, even though I don't know the position of every single particle, I still get this. Uh, 10 is a little bit too much, maybe. Something like that? OK. I still have the whole effect over here. So the way, it, uh, the way this is done is just taking the blur version and apply, like apply it a couple of times. Uh, we get those color fringe over here just by displaying three versions of it, one multiplied by blue, one multiplied by green, and one by, by red, and you, you get this interesting effect. Uh, so this is how we shipped the, uh, the demo. Uh, currently, I'm working on, on a different effect um, that I can show to you right now. So I'm going to add, to put back this over here. So maybe I can show you back to the lighthouse over here. OK. Well, it's not very visible, so I'm going to remove it again. And back at an exaggerated version. OK, so this is, this is how. This is the effect we, we've put in the demo that uh, we released. And here I have a slightly different version. Something like that. So here I've been playing, taking, so the technique is still the same. You take a couple of pictures and you add them on top of each other. But here the trick is I wanted to, to have those arcs over here. And I just tried to take the picture, and instead of adding it, to put a negative factor. Uh, obviously, you'd have to clamp that, because otherwise you're going to have nonsense. 
But okay, it's not completely finished, but it seems to be working fairly well. Like you have those fringes over here that somehow remind things like that. It's not perfect yet, but it's a, it's an interesting effect. And for the for the lines over here, well, it's just multiplied by a, by some made-up function, and I mean you can figure that out pretty easily. Um, so here I just let the demo run, and let's see when we have okay thing like that. So we're going to have this kind of effect. Maybe we can see how it looks in a, in a different place of the demo. Um, ah. Tac. Tac. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is true. Okay, so for example, we have those particles over here. Don't have much effect. Yeah, so you, so you see how it behaves. There is an uh, there is a an artifact over here. Ah, I have to recompute everything. I'm trying to show you. Okay, no. Yes, this. So this over here is something I don't want. Uh, that is because I'm hitting the, the border of the image, and it's leaking, and it's, I mean, we don't have the information that the thing doesn't know what to do. Um, so here we're using the uh, clamp to edge. Um, so I'm not quite sure what would be the best thing to do. Uh, there are tricks with uh, a little bit like pre-multiplied alpha, where you say, OK, I'm out of the picture, so I'm going to multiply by 0. And I take that into account when, when, I, when I blur. Uh, but then you would have like a black line. Uh, maybe it can be mitigated by, uh, by saying, when I get close to the border, I'm going to, like, to decrease the effect. OK, this, well, I mean, you would have to, uh, you'd have to try. Anyway, um, so the next effect is the light streak. Uh, so when you have, say, a, a Panavision style of camera, so a, an anamorphic uh, style of camera, so you know the ID, it's, uh, it goes on a 35 millimeter film, but you want the image to, match, to, to be much larger. You, you want something very horizontal. You think of those uh, westerns from the 60s. Uh, so what they do for that in the cinema is they have a lens that is going to uh, that is going to distort the image. Uh, I did distort this image to get this. So I found this on Vimeo. The guy was tr making some tests with the lens flare, and the image was all you know all cropped sort of. So I had to I had to stretch it to make to make it look this way, but it was much shorter. And because of this lens, you have those lines, so you can see like this very typical line over here and this very typical line over here. And this is not post-processing. Like this is out of the camera without any change of any sort. There is not even color mapping over here. Uh, you have also this vertical line here, plus the usual flares here. So how do we get a line like that, which is brighter over here than it is over here? Um, so if you're lazy, what you can do is just have the, light, the, the line of the same intensity all the way, so you just have to blur your image. Uh, you, you make like a shorter version, um, and then you blur it, and you're happy. Uh, what you can do is use the, the technique by, uh, by Kawase. Uh, so the technique is we're going to read. So I want to know the color of this pixel over here. And at the first pass, I'm going to use the, this pixel, this one, and this one. And I'm going to use uh, a, dec a decaying um, factor, and I'm going to add this. And as a second pass, I'm going to use this one, this one, this one, this one, so times four. And as a third pass, I'm going to do times four again. And this way, you very quickly have very long trails. 
so this over here is the piece of code that, uh, that does just that. So you give it the, uh, the pass. So it's the same shadow you, co you call a couple of times. So you give it the pass. It's going to compute the distance. It's going to, to compute the weight that you add to, uh, to your color. So you have like the, the four samples that you're going to use. And here you have the direction of your, of your streak. So in this example, it's horizontal. So I took like the, in, the inverse of the resolution just to know the size of my pixel. And I'm going like uh, in the x direction, but you could go any direction. You could go in, in oblique or whatever, whatever you want. And so I'm multiplying by i, and I'm multiplying by b. So b is, for this pass, how, how far away I'm going to fetch it. And you just add it up, and you get, uh, you get effects like, uh, so I'm going back to my lighthouse, because it's a, hello, lighthouse. Uh, so we have we had this so far, and oh, again. <laughs> nope. Okay. So that was this. So yeah, here we have like this very horizontal effect and this very vertical effect. Uh, so if I remove the original picture, you can see it goes very far. And this is done in four passes. Um, although we didn't want to, you could do that, but uh, we didn't want to pay for the full resolution picture. So we used the scaled down uh, picture, the same one we used for, for the blurred. Um, I haven't tried, but my, my gut feeling is if you want, uh, say, an effect like this, like a, this sort of uh, camera lens flare, you want a blurred version probably. But if you want some you know, sparkling effect, like for example, shiny glitter and stuff like that, maybe you want a, f a full re resolution so you have like finer trails. Um, so the last effect I'm going to talk about is motion blur. So the idea of the motion blur is when you have a camera and you take a picture or a video at any frame of your video, what happens is your shutter opens, some light gets in for a certain amount of time, and then your shutter closes. So what you've been recording is the light that has come between T something to T plus something. So it's, uh, you, you're going to, if you do photography, you, you're probably aware of the, um, uh, of the shutter speed. So the shutter speed is never zero. Like it, you can get it close, you can, uh, you can get it to one four thousandth of a second, but it's never zero. In the renderer though, what you do is you render the scene at t equals something. So it's like an infinitely small amount of time. Uh, it is difficult. So what you so the difference is with a with a long shutter speed you you're going to have like this motion blur that we that you can't get uh, with your uh, with your renderer. So if you want to get this effect, one thing you could do is render your image many times and just add it on top of each other. But it's going to cost you a lot. Um, plus you're going to have uh, artifacts because if you render your image ten times uh, on a picture like that, you're going to have ten very clear lines. Uh, if you're doing ray tracing, what you do, what you can do is a stochastic approach, where for each pixel you you just throw a dice and say, oh, t equal pl t plus random. Uh, so for a standard renderer, what we're using at least, and I think that's a common in the industry, is um, the uh, sorry, it's to use a velocity map based uh, motion blur. So you render your image, but Aside with it, you also render uh, a picture that says how fast your pixels are moving around. And when you have this information, you, so you have the color of your pixel on one side, you have the speed of your pixel on the other side, and you just blur in the direction of the, of the, of the motion vector. Um, so the first step to get this picture that I can show you, by the way, over here. So normally, I can show it to you. Yes. 
So this is the motion vector. I, I can even show it to you in real time. So the color tells you how fast things are moving. So over, over here, since we're moving forward, you have the, this green to red gradient. But those balloons are moving up, so they're, they're more like in the yellow part of the color. So how we do that is when you render your mesh on the screen, um, we're going to render the mesh. We are going to compute the position on the, on the mesh at the moment we're rendering it, plus, uh, say, 10 milliseconds ago. Um, so we are completely independent from the frame. We're not adding frame on top of each other. We, we're like, okay, we're doing a rendering at 60 frames per second. So we, I want to compute the image now, and I want to compute the image 15 or 16 milli milliseconds ago. To do that, uh, we need. We need to compute this velocity map. So in the vertex shader, uh, we need. So usually, what you do is something like that. Oh, sorry. So you have like a position equals your pro, your ma matrix multiplied by the, the position of your of your vertex. Um, which, if you have a vertex shading, maybe you want to animate your your sh your vertex over here. So what we do is we compute a second one, like the old one, for example, and we animate it with t minus a like different t. The position is, no, is not going to change. It's still what, what you did so far. But we're also going to compute a speed. So the speed is varying. That, uh, so it's a vertex uh, attribute. So for each vertex, we are also saving the speed. And that's the speed between all position, current position. So there is nothing tricky over here, except for this. Um, so because of uh, so because of um, when, when you save vertex attributes, it's going to be interpolated uh, before you get it in the fragment shader. And if you get your interpolation wrong, you're going to get all sorts of artifacts when you when your uh, triangle is clipped or things like that. So now in the fragment land, you get the speed of each fragment that has been interpolated. And that is cool because we, uh, we made the assumption that the, um, that the speed is, li uh, that your motion vector uh, is linear, like it's a along a line. Uh, so if you have a wheel or something like that, it doesn't quite work. But if, you, if your difference of time is small enough, you say, well, that's close enough to a line. So what we do is uh, you have your usual color that you output, but you also output on, the, on a different render target. You also output the speed of, of, uh, of your fragment. Um, I'm using a trick over here. So the idea is when the speed is very, very small, like when you're barely moving, it's going to be difficult for the, to get the, uh, enough precision for the, to know the direction of your vector. Like if your vector is, say, uh, like if you have eight bits, for example, and the, and the length of your vector is just one, well, you don't have any, any direction anymore because you ha have only the choice between zero and one. So what we do is we normalize that, that vector and we store the normalized vector so you have a good direction. And we store the, the length of that vector in, in a third place. So that's what we do, we do over here. And so now we have, our, um, we have this map over here that we saved. And when we, when we apply the, the post-processing, we're just going to use it over here. Um, so let's see. At six. Okay. So, so here I have the non blurred version. And if I do this, I have the blurred version. Uh, it works fairly well, but there are a couple of problems uh, happening. Um, so on, on a scene like that, it works fairly well. Now the problem is, um, sorry, I'm going to la let it run while I speak. Um, the problem is when you blur the, when you blur your image, what you want to know is you have your you have your pixel that says I'm moving at this speed, and basically you want this pixel to bleed over the neighboring pixel. But 
the way GPU are made is it's very easy to know the information from the neighbor uh, pixels, but it's very difficult to 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 have change another pixel like uh, that is not you. Your fragment shader is is applied to one pixel, not the other one. So what you could do is say, okay, I'm, because I, when I have one pixel, I don't know what is the speed of the pixel n nearby. So you could do a huge kernel and try to see who is bleeding on top of me, but that is going to be insanely expensive. So what, what we do here is uh, we're going to say, okay, uh, it's a strong assumption, but let's say that uh, if I have two pixels that are close to one another, maybe their speed is fairly close too. And then, instead of trying to know the, the, the speed of the next pixel, I'm going to, to, to make the assumption of the opposite. I say, okay, if, um, since uh, the next pixel is supposed to be the same speed as mine, then I'm going to use his speed and, uh, and like, uh, bleed it on top of myself. So it, here you can see where it doesn't work because we have this pole here that is moving very fast and it's assuming everything behind it to, to move just as fast and then we, we have like this very bad artifact. Uh, so I don't really have a solution for that, uh, except that it's like here it's moving very fast, so we don't really notice it. But if you pause it, then it's very obvious. Uh, another artifact we have is uh, at the bottom over here. Because we say, okay, we, we're going to use the, we're going to make other pixel bleed on top of myself, but I don't want stuff that is ba behind me to, to bleed on top of me. So we use the, we use the if and say, okay, like for, for as much as this distance, it's okay, but like uh, if we go beyond this, it's not okay, and the okay not okay line is over here. Um, so for this case in particular. Uh, I noticed that I could, for example, if I do this, so if I do something like that, it looks better. It, it looks more acceptable. But here what I did is I reduced the, the size of the motion blur. So now it looks more correct, but in a way it's less correct because it's, uh, the, the motion blur is not adapted to the, to the time frame I set. So it's, it's going to feel more clunky. It's, it's going to feel less motion. Um, uh, another problem I have is, so it's basically the same problem, but m more extreme. For example, if I go here, I have particles that are moving, and they're moving slow, so it's OK. And then over here, you don't have any sense of motion at all. But if I look at the, uh, at the velocity map, nope, not this one. Not this one either. You see there is a lot of motion in, in this picture. But the problem is exactly the same as the previous one. Uh, but here, since my particle is so small, I don't have anything to blur with it. So you just get, yes, a couple of pixels uh, that have been blurred, but the result is still no motion blur at all. So, so here I don't really have a solution at the moment. Uh, maybe we could do a pre-pass or something like that on the motion blur, but at the moment it doesn't quite work. Um, so that's it for motion blur. Uh, what I can show to you now is uh, the different steps. Oh. Well, I can la let it run uh, up until this example over here. OK, so yes. So what I'm going to show it to you now, yeah, so th those are the examples I've sh just shown to you. So let's look at what happens to one frame uh, here. So at first, we get this. This is what our forward rendering pass does. Oops, that's not what I want, meant to do. OK, we co at the same time we compute that frame, we also compute the velocity map. Then we also compute 
this guy over here that we are using. Uh, so this one you would use for depth of field, but we don't have depth of field in this demo in particular. But we also use it for motion blur, again, to avoid having background stuff leaking on top of foreground stuff. Then we compute the blurred version that we are going to use for glow. We are going to use it for lens flare. We are going to use it. Uh, I don't remember if we use it for something else. But there is a lot of things we can do with this blur version. Oh. Then this is the, the light streak I talked about. So we have a horizontal version. This is in two paths. We have to the right, to the left. Then we have the vertical pass. So we store that in another picture. Oh, sorry. This is the, the original picture with stone mapping and the, uh, the lens orb over there. So this is not done in, well, it's done in post-processing, but it's done in really in the frame buffer. We're going to modify the image with the, the lens orb because it was easier to do this way. Uh, the premise, the motion blur is going to apply to, the, to those uh, here. It's not something we want, but otherwise it would, it would be too complicated, I believe. Okay, so this is with the with the lens flare. Although it's not the version we had in the. Uh, okay, it's getting more difficult now. <laughs> and finally. Okay, so here. Sorry. Okay, Emacs with one hand is quite difficult. Then we have the the light streaks. <laughs> Thank you for the support. Oh, man. And finally, the vignetting, um, well, which I'm not talking about today, but it's a fairly simple effect. Uh, that's about it. I hope we have time for a couple of questions, maybe not too much. OK, that's it. You have four minutes. Please kick your questions. So the problem with the um, motion blur that you are looking at the velocity of, of your own pixel, would it make sense to apply a Gaussian blur on the velocity map? <laughs> okay, uh, for the next question I propose that you come over here. Uh, so yeah, I, we've thought about it, like taking the velocity map and then applying a blur to it. Uh, it's definitely something that we are wondering, wondering about. We haven't tried yet. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I don't know how much sense it, it makes. Like, um, it's something that, uh, as a gut feeling, yeah, we, we would try to do that, but would any big problems? I don't know yet. Uh, I don't know until I try by myself. Anyone else, please? Okay, well, I expect your renderers to be gamma correct by next year. <laughs> by, tomorrow. by tomorrow, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>